Sabbath Church. Yeah, I would like you to welcome you all to the wonderful Sabbath and as we all praise and worship God. In the commencements of our service, we're going to start with the song number 262, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. with your masks on. pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for the blessing of a wonderful Sabbath day where we can find rest and rejuvenation for our tired bodies. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit be with us as we worship you. It is always a joy to give you praise and worship. So, Father, we ask you to bless this service and be with us now in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And welcome. And it's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And um, I want to say hello to everybody here. Is there any visitors here today? Any visitors? Hey! <laughs> nice to have you. <laughs> nice to have you guys. Um, you're always welcome. We hope to see you again and we hope you enjoy the service. And um, all those watching from um, Freedom's Hour TV, welcome. All the YouTubers, welcome. It's nice to have you worshiping with us today. It's so great to see everybody here this morning. I missed you guys. I've been away since um, December. I went away for two weeks to England. It was supposed to be two weeks, <laughs> but I had problems with my, um, was it personal Alzheimer? Yeah, that word. <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't let me back in Germany, but it was great. I think it was God's plan because I had an extra four more weeks vacation. So I was able to spend it with my son and my family and relatives, and it was great. It was a time that I really needed, so I thank God for that. But it's also great to be back with you guys. I missed you so much. It's so nice to be with you. So today, what do we have for you? Mm, let me see now. We have the praise team is going to lead us out in praise and worship. And we also have Emily leading us out in prayer, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, there'll be more singing. And um, then we have a speaker today from Berlin. His name is Pastor Klaus Schmidt. 
welcome. <laughs> and um, Stefan, Pastor Stefan will introduce him to us later. Then we have, uh, um, he's also going to tell the children's story, so that would be great. So um, let us get ready for praise and worship, okay? And I hope you have a blessed Sabbath. Enjoy. Yes, as we all be on our stand, singing the song number. Oh, now we are going, we are going not, we are not going to stand. We'll sing while seated with our mask on. Song number five, three, four. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It feels very good to be back. Uh, please bow your heads and pray with me. Hello, God. It's us again. Um, like I said before, it feels really good to be here again. Um, thank you for being with us and helping us to go through what has been a chaotic past couple of weeks, and thank you for giving our leaders the strength to help us through that. Please help us in the new year to come. Um, I know it's already been a month, but it still feels very new. Thank you for your courage and strength and your love. Thank you for a beautiful sunny Sabbath day and help us all to spend it worshiping you and communing with each other. Amen. 
again here we are not only speaking but being able to be heard you recognize the music you know it's kids time now my name is Klaus K L A U S that's a little bit like Santa Claus <laughs> but no presents with me and not only showing up in winter time or at Christmas. I have lectured here the last semester, perhaps to your dad, I don't know. And now I'm going to have the sermon with the adults. But before, of course, that's first thing, put first things first, children's time, kids time. We see each other because we have eyes. We are able to listen to each other because we have ears. We can speak to each other because we have a mouth. That's fine. We have one mouth, but two ears and two eyes. So maybe it's helpful to see more and to listen to much more things than to speak out things. But now I want to talk with you about your eyes. You have the possibility to direct your eyes into different directions. Look into the left or to the right or above or down. Now, if you think it over, when, in which circumstance, in which situation, do you look into which direction? Let's suppose you are able to ride a bicycle. Are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, fine. And you remember how it started. You were taught by your mom or dad, they helped you to get onto that bike and to go forward, didn't you? Yes. Yes. And perhaps, perhaps they stood at the end of your bicycle and perhaps they ran with you. And when they said something concerning your eyes, what did they say? Where are you to look at? Not down to your feet on the pedals, but your eyes straight forward to where you want to go. That's the way you're riding a bicycle, okay? Okay. Crossing a street. There are only little streets here at Friedensau village, but nevertheless, could 
perhaps be a little bit dangerous if you were not aware of the cars, of the bicycles, of the cows. Are there cows in Friedenshaal? Huh? Are there horses in Friedenshaal? Yes, yes, yes. And so you have to be careful. Now you stand at the corner of the street. Let's do it. Standing here at the curb, so to speak. And now, this is the street going along here from left to right. And the traffic, and the cars, and the bicycles, and the best pedestrians. No, 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 no. So, what to do with your eyes? Where to look to first? What did your mom say? If you want to cross the street, where to look first? Left and right. Looking to the left first. Why to the left first? Because here in our country, the first traffic you could meet, the first car you get an encounter with comes from the left. So you look to the left. And then, of course, you are fully right. You look to the right, and then you cross the street. But if you live in Great Britain or in Japan, you look to the right, and then to the left, and then you cross the street. OK, fine. You did well. You learned something. That's fine. So if you look up above. Well, inside it's not so interesting. Seeing the ceiling made of wood, but it's nice, it's high, it gives us some room to breathe. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. If we are outside, what do we see outside when we look up? What would you see outside? Looking up, perhaps, any idea? What can you see outside, above you, perhaps? You see something flying there, that would be? Bird. A bird, yeah, or a bee, or Yes, fine. And you could see there are white, sometimes uh, they are a bit dark, sometimes it rains out of that. Yeah, what's it? What do you see there? Mm. Clouds. Yeah, clouds. And hope, no, not clouds. <laughs> I'm not at the sky. I'm above and uh, here down on earth. But clouds, yeah, fine. And hopefully not too seldom the sun. We call that what is above us there, we call it sky. Don't we call it that? We call it sky. But we have a second, another word for what it's high above us. We don't call it sky. We call it heaven. And the difference is we can see the sky, things at the sky. In the darkness, we see the stars. In daytime, Daylight, we see the sun, and so on. But what is in heaven above? Who is in heaven above? God? Yeah. Don't speak too softly about him. It's strong word, God. It's something like an abbreviation of the good one. The absolute good one, God. We don't see him, 
but hopefully we feel him. So if we say, eyes up, look unto not sky, but heaven above, we could also say, close your eyes, look into yourself, look into your heart, feel him there. God's grace, God's love, and that's why it's necessary not only to see things on earth, but to be assured that he is there with his love for us. Everywhere, not really to be seen, but to be experienced and to be felt. I hope you felt God and you do feel him within your heart. It's like the love of your mother, but stronger, maybe. It's like the love of your father and your friends and grandfathers and all those who love you. But always there, be assured, always there, looking unto you and loving you. That's why we have our eyes open, not only to the sky, but to heaven above, and feel God's love. All right? That's what we do with our eyes. That's the best thing we could possibly do. Thank you for being here. Pastor, for the wonderful children's story. We're going to have uh, another item from our SDA hymnal book, song number 545, Savior, Life is Shed. Yeah. 
The scripture reading today is taken from Mark 6, verse 45 to 51. So that's Mark 6, for all those that have their Bibles. Mark 6, verse 45 to 51. And it reads, Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. After telling everybody goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boats in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once, and he said, don't be afraid, take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. May God bless the reading of these words. Amen. Our speaker this morning is Pastor Klaus Schmitz. Officially, he's retired. But retirement for him means being a chaplain at the hospital, the Adventist hospital in Berlin, and being a lecturer here in Friedensau. Some of your students, Klaus, are sitting right here, feasting one last time, knowledge, wisdom, and blessings at your feet. Before you come to speak to us, I would just like to take a moment to pray. We also want to recognize his wife, Margaret, here with us. Welcome. Let us pray for Klaus. You can come up. And I will dutifully put back my mask since you're no closer. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you that we are able to meet again in person here in the chapel 
ask that you bless us as we hear your word now. Bless those at the, on the TVs and on YouTube. And bless Klaus as he speaks to us. We lay it all into your hands with thanksgiving in your name. Amen. Well, hello and happy Sabbath to you all. I'm not here among you as a professor, teaching, giving input or impulses. I'm here among you, amidst you, as a preacher, listening to the Word of God, written down in the Gospel of Mark for today. That's the passage I have chosen, listening, trying to understand, and hoping that God will bless his word so that this sermon can reach us not only in our mind and not only in our feelings, but in our whole, what we call, existence as humans, as men and women, adult and young. The content of this sermon, we listen to the scripture reading from Mark 6, is a narrated incident, a special experience of friends and co-workers of Jesus of Nazareth. Of course, that's a specific time and space, Lake of Gennesaret, the Galilean Sea, in the lifetime of Jesus. It's a mostly friendly and warm landscape, perhaps just the opposite than Friedensau. You have to endure this location with its coldness, and even more stressful with its corona, COVID disease. It's a small village called Meadow of Peace. Well, I don't know whether you find this name fitting or not fitting in the time you have spent here already. But hopefully fitting is that sermon that Initially, Mark preached while writing and giving further his gospel. Followers and friends of Christ were the first receiving this gospel. Confessed believers and hopefully, nevertheless, searchers of wisdom searches for life, searches for truth. The story reported and told by Mark is partly a specific Christian and partly a fundamental Christian message in my perspective. There are three parts, three scenes, so to speak, belonging together and being connected, closely tied together, even interwoven within the text of the gospel. In my sermon, I will set the first two parts separate concerning the two acting persons or groups, Jesus and the disciples, and bringing them together like the Bible does in the third part of my sermon. This story starts, Mark chapter 6, verse 45, with the word immediately. So something is happening immediately after something else had happened. And what had happened before, you find it in your Bibles from verse 30 onward, uh, subscribe the feeding of the 5,000. Now Mark binds those two events 
together, or shall I say, separating the two events sharply, because there is Jesus' command starting the story, starting the event which is ongoing to be told immediately after the first thing had happened and had come to an end, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, Jesus commands them and says, it's time to make a break, to break out, to go forward. I don't know with what feelings they are there in the boat, thankful for what they had experienced, for rightly understood it was Jesus having done the miracle, but the bread had been multiplied in the hands of the disciples. So if you had asked the multitude what they had experienced when being fed, they would say, well, just a normal thing, just something which happens in every day, everyday life, someone offering me bread and fish, someone giving me so that I can live. So I don't know what feelings were in Jesus' disciples, those 12, so to speak, in the boat. Thankfulness or pride or surprise? Are they bound to themselves and their feelings or to their Lord? I don't know. I don't know what lies behind you as students and families with your families and children here. This the semester uh, is past, so to speak. Perhaps it's partly before you with some exams, I don't know. Good luck for that, if that should happen. And then free time, leisure time, study time, writing papers, hard or easy. I don't know what is behind you, but there is something before you. I'm quite sure about that. At once, immediately, that's how Mark starts his sermon, Jesus commands the friends and co-workers into the boat, into that sailor's boat, which has already been used earlier. You find that in the same chapter, Mark 6. His or is, and this was not precisely translated when we listen to the scripture reading, his order is, not only going to Bethsaida, that's right, this is the locality, that is the geographic point. But in the Greek text it reads, go to the other side, go into the future, find a new space, find new people, find new possibilities, Find new life, perhaps. Find your future or the future. Go forward. It's our life's boat where we are in and as individuals. There is no possibility to stop ongoing life. There is no possibility to go backwards in time and in life, except in our memories, of course but not in real. In reality, it's ongoing, going forward, all the time, endlessly, without any stop. It only stops when our heartbeat stops. And I hope this is a long time ahead for every one of us. Till then, humans are always on the way to the other side, to the other shore, to the opposite shore. 
into the future, commanded by the word of Christ, and you could as well say commanded by an absolute necessity. That's how life is structured, going onward into the future. And of course, you are not only in your individual boat going to the other side. We are in a ship called church, commanded to fulfill a task into new fields, planning new projects, finding new perspectives within our missionary endeavor. What do we meet along our way, sitting in the boat called church, going into future times? By what are we met, so to speak? What is our experience? When the story started, it said, late in the evening, in the middle of the lake, no motorboat, but rowing, perhaps sometimes sailing, darkness, no electricity on board, perhaps a little bit light, but mostly only the stars shining, and you in the middle of a lake, a sea. How do you feel? Threatened? Worrying? Well, shall I say, don't worry, be happy? <laughs> It just has to do with the question, what is before us? Where are we going into? What is the next moment coming, showing? It's not a favorable situation. Water is without beam. It could be a sign for danger. It's less than danger, but it's hard enough Headwind, adverse winds, adverse circumstances, not really a storm, not life-threatening, but wind against you. The stronger that wind against you is, the more power you need to get forward. And if the wind, the storm, the hurricane has 180 kilometers, you can't stand and you can't think about going forward any centimeter. Well, the wind is against them. I don't know how you feel the wind against you, if you feel it. It's nature against you, like coronavirus, that's nature, just nature, but hard enough. It's the elements, perhaps, against you, earthquake, flood, fire. There are life events against you, sickness, poverty, bad things happening to the church, to the individuals going forward under the command with the word of Lord Jesus. They wouldn't have thought of such a negative encounter, I suppose. External distress and probably, assumedly, I suppose, inner distress. Don't you think? Questions, doubts. Is this our way 
Are we on the right way? The question of certainty or assurance. Questioning the understanding or the meaning of the word of Jesus who commanded, get into the boat, go into the other side, find, gain future. Nothing. Being stopped. That's not what you asked for, what you believed in. Should not the Lord's word contain a promise like that? Successful forward, achieving all our goals, victory. I would like, like to have a promise like that, so to speak, a guarantee for my life and for my future. But assumedly, obviously, that's how I experience life and that's how they experience life. That's not reality. Who is he in reality if his word, which commanded them to go forward, proves to be empty? or a false prophecy? Hmm. Yesterday, feeding 5,000, a big thing. Today, tonight I should say, a big disappointment. Circumstances in which we get, in which they get, experience they make, speak with loud voices, with a clear language, so to speak, we are not quite sure what his word means, whether indeed he is Lord of everything and of all. So, in between the lines, knowing humans' hearts and feeling, I think inner distress is much more painful for them than the outward distress with the adverse winds. Would you agree? Thank you. And the question, of course, is, not only who is he then in reality, comparing yesterday to tonight, and where, where at all is he, that Jesus? He is not with them. And we take the second part of the story and the sermon, where is Jesus? I said in introducing that paragraph to us, the text, the different sentences with disciples as the persons in it, and with Jesus as the subject in the grammatical subject in the sentences in, these sentences are interwoven, tightly connected. One sentence to the other in the Gospel of Mark, changing perspective. Perspective to the disciples, then to Jesus, back to the disciples, back to Jesus, and so on. I left that out. I do now come to the other perspective, looking unto Jesus. Is he distant? Is he near? He wanted to have the last word. He wanted the multitude from yesterday to have him as their last vision. 
That's why he commanded the disciples to go into the boat and to go onward even before him, even without him. He wanted to say goodbye to the multitude whom he, through God's power and grace, had fed. He wanted them to have that lasting and last impulse, not only the 12, but him as the Lord of them. And now he is going to the land, and verse 46 says, going into prayer. Where? And there a second time may be your English translation, and that's not different to German translation, well understood, is not precisely enough. Mark doesn't speak about a hill or a mountain or some perhaps geographically known or not known. He speaks about the mountain, precisely spoken out with a definite article, as if we all ought to know what the mountain means, where the mountain is located. And do you know any story where the mountain plays a prominent role? Of course, it starts in the Old Testament. It's the mountain of the Lord, the mountain. Well, afterwards in the Gospel of Mark, it's the mountain of transfiguration. And there you see what is coming, what is coming next. And that indeed is preluded, shall I say that, here also. He is going up, not disappearing totally, but now he is near to God, close to God. He is above us. We are down on the land, and even the disciples now in our story and event, not even on the soil where your feet can easily find their standpoint, but being in the middle of the lake where you can't find any firm standpoint. And so they are down and he is up and he's far away, it seems. He's close to the eternal. Maybe he's already turning into the light of the eternal already being a bit, so to speak, transformed. He is alone on the land. That means disciples are left alone. They have each other, but that's in that moment of no help because of their questions, because of them questioning the word of the Lord and the existence of the Lord and the nearness of the Lord because of their doubts. And Jesus, watching, there is a song. God is watching us from a distance. Well, he is watching, but he is not distant from them. He is close to them. Mark says explicitly his side is on them. He looks unto them. His perspective is on the church in the boat. His perspective is unto the believers. He is the, all, the whole world inside, of course, but especially he looks to the believers. He sees them, 
struggling, darkness, distress inward, greater than outward. And he's moved by compassion and understanding and love, and that's why he decides, I have to come to them, come close to them, come to his own. And when he comes, light is starting to light a bit. Fourth watch, three o'clock in the morning. Now, morning will come, definitely. He sees, he comes, and he wants to show up. That's all he wants, to show himself to those who are on the way in the boat of faith, troubles outside and inside. And that would be the real help, just to show up, just to demonstrate you are not forgotten. You are not unseen. I'm close to you. I am here. He meets them. It's an encounter to those who know him. And it's terrible what's being told now in the sermon of Mark, they react with fear, out of fear, misunderstanding the appearance of their Lord as if he would be a bad spirit, a demon, a ghost. So something additional negative is perceived by them. Not only the adverse winds, with the doubts inside, but now, second terrifying encounter, something indefinite, where you don't know what's going on there, appearing. An unexpected encounter, even more troubling and terrifying than the counter wind seeing ghost instead of the Lord. Think of, about that. Does that happen nowadays? That Christian speak about demons, bad spirits, where others would find the Lord in? Well, there are conflicts about singing books, hymn books, and there are some who say, these chords, this rhythm, that's demonic. You can't find the Lord in it. Well, well, that's not the same, of course. We do not live by singing the one or another sim book. But if you do, tragically misunderstand the appearance of the Lord within your life. That's cost, that could cost your life. He wants to pass by. Is it his fault and guilt, so to speak? It's counterproductive in that moment, incomprehensible for them. So is it strange and a false idea from this Jesus? Hmm. And in as much as Mark thought readers could understand his signal when he says going up to the mountain, he obviously expects People could understand that it's not negatively meant when the passage reads, he wanted to pass them by. Because all those who are believing in the scripture, all those who have already 
had a close relationship to the God of Israel know how the God of Israel appeared to the most prominent person of Israel with whom everything started? When Moses said, Lord God, I do not go any further step into the future. If you do not show me, you are at my side. Can't you appear? Can't you show your glory and your power, your power and your glory, so that I can rely on that? And God says, yes, I will do what you ask for, but the mode of my appearance, the mode of encountering me is not being a spectator, seeing something coming unto me and saying, oh, look, this is the eternal. We see him coming from a distant. He is not an object which you could look at as you look unto all earthly objects. His way of appearing is going by, passing by. That's what happens to Moses. And Moses feels well with it. No complain afterwards, because when passing, he not only sees only a little bit looking behind, but he hears something. And it's not the noise when God passes. It's a word, it's a message when he passes by. And the message reads like that. I'm close to you. I'm here with my compassion, with my mercy, with my power. You are not left alone. But in as much as the 12 disciples in the boat do badly misunderstand that mode of experience which is quite common to the heavenly world, so to speak, Jesus has to calm them down. And he does what, thanks to God, he does with us also. If we do misunderstand any appearances, he speaks to us in clear words. Beginning, middle, and end. Be of good cheer. Fear not. Fear not anymore. Do not be afraid. Do not be or remain in fear. That's covering up the, the message. And in the center, well, maybe it's a third part where we have to look into the original text and compare it to the scripture as such. Does he say, hey friends, hello, it's me? Yes, of course, it's something like that, but it's more, it's deeper, it's more fundamental and means much more and something different than, hello, it's me. He says, I am. Like God said, I am to Moses when he first met him. In the first encounter, Exodus 3, God said, I am, Greek version. I am with you, I am the great I am. Nothing else. And no one else who could say something like that. 
his presence, being with us, being there for us, as a person, so to speak, invisible, but as a power, effective, and full of energy, energizing us. Storm settles. It does not always, always settle externally, so to speak, in our lifetime. But hopefully, at least, the inward storm settles down and comes down. So, there is only one thing that we ultimately, and so to say, in a uh, everlasting perspective, we do need, in eternal perspective, that God does reveal himself to us. In the encounters, may they be unexpected and hopefully mostly in his word. And now I would like to sing a closing song to you just with that message, with that prayer in mind, a longing in our hearts, O oh Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us.
We like to pray and please stand up. Yes, Father in heaven, there's a longing in our heart. We like to see you, to feel you, to go with you, to have you nearby us. Please be with us. Please open our eyes and mind to see you, to understand you, and go with you. That is a wish in our heart. That is what we pray for. Don't worry, you say, don't worry about anything, but in all your prayers, ask God for what you need. Always ask him with a thankful heart. And God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with Jesus Christ. Amen. There is a longing in our hearts for God to reveal himself to us. We have this hope that burns within our hearts that one day Jesus will come again. Hallelujah. It's time that we sing song 214. We have this hope. Amen. Thank you very much, praise team. And that brings us to the end of our service. It's been great worshiping with you all. Viewers online, thank you. Freedom Sour TV, thank you. Technicians, praise team, pianists, and Pastor Klaus, thank you so much for that inspiring service, um, sermon. May God bless you and your family as well. Okay, everybody, it was great worshiping with you. I hope you have a blessed week. Stay safe, and we'll see you again next Sabbath. God be with you. Amen.